Church, we're starting a new sermon series for the month, and it's entitled uh, Soul Detox. And, and, you know, there's so many things in our lives that maybe aren't right. I want you to think about right now, like, what's chipping away at your soul? You know, what's getting in the way of you becoming uh, the, the person that, that God created you to be? This, I want us to look this whole month at the things and the damaging influences in our lives that show you the way. I want to show you the way to embrace the clean living that God has for you. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, it says this to his church. It says, run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Instead, pursue righteousness. Instead, pursue righteous living. Sorry, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Church, today we're going to be starting this sermon series and, and we're going to be talking about the restless soul. The restless soul. See, we need to understand, first of all, before we get any further in this series, we need to understand that we are not a body with a soul. Too many times we just look at it that way. We, we put so much emphasis on our bodies. We are not a body with a soul, but what we are is we are a soul with a body. That's who we are. And when God created Adam, when he created Adam and Eve, he, he described it this way in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. He said this, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Man became a living soul. Why does this matter to us, church? As we kick off the series, why exactly does this matter? I, I want you to think about how purposeful God is. You know, God is very purposeful in the creation of us and in who we are, our souls, our bodies, our very being. And, you know, when I was a kid, I, I remember my parents despised smoking. They really did. I'm not coming down on smokers today, so don't take it the wrong way. But because of my parents just really and truly not, they just did not care for that. When I was a kid, I thought smoking sent you to hell. That's just the way I looked at it. And I want you to know, it doesn't send you to hell, but I tell you this, it will make you smell like you've already been there and come back is what it makes you smell like. It will. And, and I remember as a kid, I would stay at my one friend's house and, and his parents, I mean, they, they were chain smokers. And they were the type, they didn't open any windows, they didn't open any doors. And I mean, that smell was just really loud inside their house. And I remember when I would go spend the night at Jimmy's house, of course. I'd go to Jimmy's house and spend the night, and, and I would go in there, and I remember walking the door, and it would just like, boom, it just hit you in the face, that smell of cigarette smoke. And, and so, but after I'd been there for hours, I got used to it. And, and I would be there, I'd spend the night, and we'd play games, whatever it is we were doing, and, and then we would leave, and I would go back to my house and I remember the one specific time, me and my younger brother, we shared a, a room together for pretty much our whole lives. And I remember walking in our bedroom, throwing my, my bag down with my clothes in it. And he goes, man, you stink. Get out of here. And I realized that smell was the smell of smoke. And as a kid, I had no clue when I went to Jimmy's house that secondhand smoke, that this, this poison could actually affect me. But I believe, church, that the same thing goes on with many of us in our souls today. Here's what it is. We are taking in the secondhand poisons of our culture, and it's literally poisoning our souls. And we talk a lot about detoxing our bodies, right? We talk about, about detoxing our water and, and maybe even our air. But this month, this whole month, I want to talk about detoxing our souls, caring for the essence of who we actually are. And so again, today, I want to talk about the curse of the restless soul. And I believe a lot of you guys are going to see yourself in this subject I'm talking about today. You know, and Adam and Eve was created, and then they had two sons, Cain and Abel. You know the story, how that goes. If you don't, I'm going to fill you in today, Cain got jealous of Abel's sacrifice, that it was being accepted. And so what Cain did is he killed his brother Abel. And in Genesis chapter 4, verse 11 through 12, gives the account of this. And here's what God did. He cursed him. He cursed Cain. 
He said this, you are now under a curse and driven from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer of the earth. See, that's what God told Cain. He said, you will be a restless wanderer of the earth. And you know, church today, I believe there's a lot of us, we have a restless soul. Many of us, we have this restless soul. We, we are always searching, but never finding. We, we are always interested in everything, but we are never satisfied by anything. Inwardly, you're always ramped up, aren't you? You know, our RPMs, they just keep going, and we might try to find rest for our bodies, but what's going on is we never find rest for our souls. We are anxious. We are tense. We are worried. Church, we are concerned. Our minds just don't know how to slow down, right? And even when we try to rest at night, internally, our soul doesn't even rest, right? We are restless souls. And so the season of life that I am in personally today, the season of life that I am in, I can honestly, just be completely bluntly honest with you, I can relate. Because, see, I'm always on the move. I'm always doing something. And inwardly, I can relate to that. It's so easy to be overwhelmed with all there is to do. I have so many things going on in, in so much of my life that I'm living in right now. And so it has been this restlessness of the soul for me. A restlessness of the soul. And I can never slow down. I, I can never focus. I, I can never truly rest. In Solomon's words in Ecclesiastes, he, he paints a really good picture of where I've lived way too much in my life personally. And chances are many of you have lived in this same place as well. In Ecclesiastes, if you'll look at it with me, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 22 and 23, it says this, what do people get for all the toil and anxious striving with which they labor under the sun? All their days, their work is grief and pain. Even at night, their minds do not rest. This too is meaningless. Even at night, his mind does not rest. I want to be really, really honest today. How many of you find yourself all wound up? You know what I'm talking about? Like, like, like at night, you're all wound up in the inside and you have a really hard time. You have a difficult time finding rest for your soul. Your body's screaming like, I need rest. You need to lay down. You, you, you need to take some time. And what happens is you can't shut it down, right? You lay down and your body's exhausted, but your mind just keeps flying a million miles an hour. Your mind and your soul, church, rarely finds deep rest. And I wonder how many of you today would say, that's exactly, preacher, where I'm at. That's exactly where I'm at in my life. You are a restless soul. And I want you to realize something today, church. God doesn't want us to live that way. He has not called us at all to, to live in this way. See, we have to acknowledge that our bodies need rest, don't we? We do. But also your soul needs rest. So where do you find rest for your soul? This is going to sound like a very churchy answer. It's going to sound like the answer. Of course, the preacher is going to say that, right? But it is true. It is true beyond a shadow of a doubt. There's only one place and one place only that we find rest for our soul's church, and that is in God. That is the only place you're going to find rest for your soul. Man, David said it this way in Psalm 62. In Psalm 62, verse 1, he says, Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. See, church, our souls inwardly and, and internally, the very essence of who we are only finds rest in God. There's no person. There is nothing, no experience. There's no vacation, no dream house, no amount of money. There's no thing on the outside of God, outside of God that can bring us rest and the essence of who you and I are, nothing. The Bible says, my soul finds rest in him and in him alone. St. Augustine, if you don't know who that is, he was a, a theologian and a philosopher from Roman North Africa forever ago. He said this to God. He was speaking to God. He said this. He said, you have made us 
for yourself, O Lord, and your and our soul is restless until it finds rest in you. Church, I want you to realize, man, when I was preparing this sermon this week, it hit home heavy for me. And I hope this hits you the same way, that our soul find rest in God and God alone, and only in God you will find that rest. And Jesus said it this way. Jesus puts it very clearly in Matthew chapter 11, verse 20 and 29. He says this, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I believe this is for some of us this morning. We're not just weary in our bodies, are we? But we are weary in our souls. You're just stressed out. And you find it difficult, don't you? You find it difficult to function properly. Maybe you find it difficult to show love to those who love you the most. Maybe you are short, very short, and and just, you know, abrupt with those who love you most because your soul is all revved up. You're overwhelmed, right? You're tensed, you're worried, you're anxious. You are not only physically, but you're revved up in your soul where it matters the most. And this is what matters more than anything, church. And Jesus is telling us here in Matthew chapter 11, he's saying, come to me. Come to me. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. And what does he say, church? He says, I will give you rest. Come to me and I I will give you the rest you need. And then he goes on and says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I'm gentle and humble in heart. And then what does it say we will find, church? It says, you will find the rest for your soul. You'll find that rest for your soul. So where do you find true rest for your soul? It's in God and God alone. And the next question that you might be asking, and man, this is one of the top five questions that preachers get asked all the time. It says, so how do I find that? How do I find that? If it's true that I rest in God, how do I find that rest in Him? And so here's what Scripture teaches us. I'm going to give you three different things the Bible teaches us. I'm going to give you a lot of Scripture today just with those thoughts. With those thoughts. And I'm praying that this scripture will land in the very heart of who you are. And so that we can be convicted and we can live according to the rhythms that God has set up for us. And live according to God's grace. Not according to the pressures, church. Not according to the pressures of the secondhand toxic smoke that this world says. You got to go, go, go. Produce, produce, produce. You got to do more, more, more. When we find rest, church, for our souls, when we seek him first... And listen, the Bible says, then he will add everything that matters most, right? Trust in me, follow me, lean not into your own understandings, and I'll add what you need. So here's three thoughts, church. Three thoughts on how we find that rest in God. The very first one is this. You be still before God. Be still before God. Psalm 46 verse 10 tells it to us this way. In Psalm 46, verse 10, it says this. He says, be still and know I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth. So let me just state the obvious to all of you guys right now. The obvious is this. The person who wrote this, he didn't say, be busy and know that I am God. He didn't say that. He he didn't say, be productive and know that I'm God. He didn't say, be worried and know that I'm God. He didn't say, be anxious and know that I am God. He didn't say, be all revved up in your soul and know that I'm God. The Bible says what? Be still. Church, that means to stop. That means to pause. That means to wait. And and that means to know. Know not just in your head of who he is, but to know in your soul. Know that, church, God is on the throne. Know that he is on the throne. To be still and know that I am God is what he said. Have you ever been around someone that can't sit still? I mean, it drives you crazy, doesn't it? <laughs> Maybe it's somebody you're married to right now. I'm one of those guys. I can't. I really can't. I can't sit still. I try. And I can't sit still. And, and, and you know, maybe you had that kid that, that, that does that all the time. And I had one of them kids once. <laughs> Wouldn't stop. I mean, just it never stopped. 
a little secret for you that Mary and I, it, it would get us so bad. Like during the summertime, it would exhaust you. We, we thank God for his teachers that they, they had him most of the day during school. <laughs> but in the summertime, <laughs> you're on your own now, right? A little secret I'll share with you. And we, <laughs> when we couldn't take it anymore, his bedtime was at a certain time, we turned the clocks up in the house, all of them. We like, look, it's time for bed. He's like, why is it still light? I don't know, but it's time for bed. Look at the clock, right? We just needed him to go to bed because it wouldn't stop. It wouldn't stop. I've repented of that because I was dishonest, okay? I did. <laughs> but sometimes you're like, man, I wish you would just shut up and be still, right? Sometimes I, I'll pull this car over, right? And we do those things, but you know what? It's just be still. And sometimes church for you and I, we point in our kids, but we're a lot like that, aren't we? Sometimes you just have to take control of your soul and you have to silence your soul, right? You have to like soul be quiet, be still, quit running. David says this, he says it to us very well in Psalm 131, he says it this way. Psalm 131, verse 2, he says, But I have calmed and quieted myself. I'm like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. So in the very beginning of verse 2, he says, You know what? I've calmed and quieted myself. I told myself to be quiet. I calmed myself down. I stilled and quieted my soul. You know, I've talked about this before from the pulpit church. You know what? It, it, it's part of my personal journey. I'm not a shamed to tell you these things but I've had two seasons in my life that I had to actually go get some counseling there's nothing wrong with counseling I want to make it very clear if you need someone to talk to you need someone to talk to you find yourself a very good Christian counselor someone who will give you wise counsel there is nothing wrong at all with seeking counsel it's biblical and there are two times in my life that I really I, I had to have some counseling it was healthy and it was helpful for me. And so I went to a, a very good Christian counselor. Guy was great. And I remember I had that, that thought process in my mind. I really needed someone to talk to, but I'm like, I don't want him to think I'm crazy. And so I walked in his office and literally there was a couch in there and then his desk and chair. I looked in the suit, I walked in, didn't even introduce myself. I said, I am not laying on that couch. <laughs> I'm not crazy. He said, I'm sure you're not. He said, you can stand up. You can sit on the floor. You can sit on, you can do whatever you want. We're just in here to talk. And, and so I'm in there. And at one of these sessions, this guy asked me this. And man, this has really and truly changed my life. This guy said to me as I was talking and talking, and maybe it was a couple sessions in, I don't know. But he said to me, he said this. He said, why do you always feel you have to prove yourself? I'm like, huh, I don't know about that. He said, no, really. He said, why do you always feel that you have to prove yourself to everyone? And then later on, he told me this, and man, this made me angry. He said, you're a workaholic. He said, you're a workaholic, and the reason you're a workaholic is because you always feel like you have to prove yourself. And I got ticked. I was angry at him. I'm like, all right, here's this Christian counselor, and he's telling me this. I, I don't like what you're saying, man. But I continue to listen. So this Christian counselor, he said to me this. He said, he said, I want you to do something for me. He said, I want you to take five minutes a day. He said, I want you to calm yourself down. He said, I want you to be quiet. He said, you still yourself before God and you focus on God and nothing else for five minutes minutes a day he said you can do it as soon as you wake up you can do it at lunchtime you can do it before you go to bed he said I want you to spend five minutes and just focus on God and nothing else and I'm like ha that's baby stuff that's ridiculous that sounds dumb is what I thought and I thought first of all who got time for that <laughs> I was a young man and then second of all I'm like that's way too easy and my third thought was, you know, I'm paying this dude $80 an hour just for him to tell me to take five minutes a day. So I tried it, church. I had to prove myself to him that I could do it. I tried it. And he told me, he said, here's what I want you to do. He said, you set a timer on on your phone he said you set that timer and you just start you be still and you focus on God and nothing else I'm like man I got this thing and so I started it and I'm kind of like hey hello God right 
one second. Second number two. I'm like, man, this is boring. <laughs> second number three, I'm like, why do I got to do this? And you know, by the fourth second, I'm staring at the wall in front of me. I'm like, man, this wall is dirty. Somebody needs to wash this. And I look up at the TV. The TV's dusty, right? The grass, Lord, you know my grass needs cut. My kids need a whooping right now. I'm going to go take care of that, Lord. The car needs washed. You know, and the bottom line was this, church. I couldn't do it. I'm being honest with you. I couldn't do it. Five minutes. I couldn't focus. I couldn't stay focused on, on, on just being with God. And you know why? It's because I have a restless soul. Church, maybe you can honestly relate to what I'm just telling you. It's very difficult for you to focus five minutes just on God and God alone, what God has for you, because your mind instantly starts to wonder, right? You start going to all these places you have no business going to. And so, church, if you are a restless soul, if you are right there with me, one of the most important disciplines that you can do daily is learn to be still with God. I'm much better at it today, but I still have days. I do, I'm being honest. I still have days where I can't, but I try to make myself. And the reason we do it, church, is this, for the sole purpose of knowing him, for the sole purpose of recognizing him, to be still. He says it in his word, be still and know. You got to know that I am God. You might say exactly what I said, well, I don't have time to be still with God. I'll tell you today, church, you don't have time not to. Time is fleeting. It really is. You must be at rest with your soul. You, you, you must be still before God. You got to be still before him. The second thing I want you to get today is this. You got to learn to wait for God. You've got to wait for God. Psalm 37. In Psalm 37 verse 7 it says this. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes so in psalm 37 verse 7 there, he's telling us he said you got to wait for me you got to be quiet in my presence and you wait for me be still before the lord and you patiently wait on him man how many of you struggle with that <laughs> we are an impatient people aren't me aren't we we don't like to wait for anything at all. I mean, nothing. You don't want to wait for anything at all. This past week, I um, was kind of inspired while I was sitting at the breakfast table. And, and so I started writing some things down that I needed for a service I had to do later on in the week. And, and man, that was kind of flowing. You know what I'm talking about? Things just start rolling. So I'm writing it down because I, I can't remember that much stuff. So I'm writing it down as we go. And, and, and so then I go about my business, get ready for work. I head down to work. And all of a sudden, I needed that thing that I was writing down. And so I'm looking for it everywhere. I looked at my notebook. I looked on my desk. I even walked out to my car. And then suddenly, it clicked in my head. And I'm like, OK. I left it at home. And so what I did is I called my wife and, and I said, hey, listen, um, I left a paper at home. Will you walk in and, and see if it's in the kitchen for me? She was in the bedroom. And she said, yeah, I'll do that. Well, if you guys know anything at all about me and my wife, we are complete opposites in this area. I do about 380 miles an hour. And my wife, God love her, um, she's blessed for this. She goes about 1.2 miles an hour. And so I'm sitting on the phone. I'm like, are you looking? And she goes, I I'm walking in there right now. And I sit there for a couple more seconds. I'm like, did you find it? She says, I'm looking for it. And I'm sitting there going like, why is this taking her so long? It's ridiculous. I need it right now. And then the Lord convicted my heart. And he's like, if you needed it on your time, then you should have went home and got it. Better yet, you shouldn't have forgot it. And here I'm harassing my wife about, pick up the pace, I need this thing right now. And she was very gracious to me. She could have said, well, come up here and get it yourself then. <laughs> but you know what, church? We don't like to wait for anything, do we? We don't. Even when someone is doing something for you, 
you don't want to wait on. Even when your God is trying to do something to you or for you, you don't even want to wait. And guess what, church? His timing's perfect. It's perfect. We don't like to wait for anything, so it's be still, church. We got to be still. We got to open up God's word, and we wait for him. We wait for him, right? How many of you, you're that kind of person that you, you pray for? You got that like six-year-old's mentality. Remember when the tooth fairy came, you lose your tooth, stick it on your pillow, boom. The next morning you wake up, there it is. I got a quarter and I hear they're getting like five bucks these days. But that's how we treat God. I'm going to pray to you right now, God. I'm going to pray tonight. And, and Lord, I know you're going to do it tomorrow. And you wake up, psh, it ain't time yet. And you get impatient with God. But you know what? You open up God's word and you wait on him. People are always saying to me, like, how do I hear from God? How do I hear from God? And, and how do I know what, what God is saying to me? And here's the answer, church. You wait for him. You stop and you wait. You stop and you wait for him. Andy Stanley, I really enjoy listening to him. If you want to hear a good speaker, he, he's great. He's one of my favorites. He once said this. He said, I wake up early every day, so I don't have to worry about the time. I open his word and ready, and I wait for something to speak to me. And when it speaks to me, I stop and I meditate on what God said. He said, sometimes it might be one verse. Sometimes it might be five chapters. When God speaks to me, I just let his word be planted deep within my soul. Church, I love that. Too many times we're like, all right, God, I, I need a word from you. I just open the Bible randomly. Wherever my finger goes, I'm going to read that one verse, and that better be the one. But God's like, oh, no, you got four more chapters to go, bub. you got to keep reading. There's something in there for you, but you got to keep reading. And, and so you wait on him. You wait on him. You wait on God. You seek him. You be still. Man, you slow down, and you be still. God will take care of the rest. God will take care of the rest for you. He'll take care of even the rest of the world while you wait on him and you seek him. Psalm 130 says this to us. Psalm 130 verses five and six says this. I am counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on him. I have put my hope in his word. I long for the Lord more than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. Man, you might have a Bible version that, that says this. A watchman, more than a watchman waits for the dawn. Let me tell you what that means. How does a watchman sit and wait? For the morning. See, in the Old Testament, this comes from the Old Testament thought process. When the, you know, the walled city was there at night, they would send a watchman up to the top of the wall, and he literally would stay up all night long just scanning and looking to see if the enemy was coming to approach to attack the city, and that was his job. And what he did was he longed for the morning to come because once morning came, then his shift would be over, and he didn't have to watch anymore. And the watchman knew this. He knew that the sun was going to come up. He knew every day when he started his watch at night, he would go up on the wall and he'd sit there at night and he would just scan. He knew that morning would come, that it's going to be here because it came yesterday. Just you realize you can have the same expectation. Just like the sun comes up, our God is going to show himself to you. He's going to reveal himself to you. Just like the sun will come up again tomorrow, God's going to reveal himself to you. We wait for the Lord as the watchman waits for the morning. Be still and you wait on God. The third point I want you to get today is this. This is hard for some of us. You take a moment and you reflect on God's goodness. You know what most of us do? Man, I hear a lot in the office. I do it myself too. People will come in and they'll just tell me, my life's a disaster and this is happening and this is happening and this is happening. And I'm like, man, your life stinks, doesn't it? Yes, it does. I'm like, is there anything at all that's good? Anything. Do you have anything in your life that's good? Some people who are deep, deep in it are like, no, there's nothing good in my life. Some people, they get that realization like, oh, I'm talking to the preacher. <laughs> and they're like, well, they give you that little kid's answer. Jesus, he's good. 
Or they start maybe telling, well, God's been good to my family. My kids are healthy. My marriage is good. You know, they go on and on and on about those things. And But so often we are trying to be still. And all we do is think about all the things that need to be done or all the things that we don't have or maybe you know, all the things that are wrong in our life. And you know what? I want you to do something else. I want you to think about all that God's really done in your life, about the things he's done. Just don't think about what needs to be done, you know, your list. Think about all he's already done in your life. Church is called internalizing his goodness. You internalize how good God has been to you. Man, in Psalm 116, verses 7 through 9, it says this. It says, let my soul be at rest again, for the Lord has been good to me. He has saved me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. And so I walk in the Lord's presence as I live here on earth. Church, why do we rest once more? Because the Lord has been good to us. You realize honestly how good God has been to you. He really has. God has been faithful to you even when you haven't been faithful to him. I can think of all the times in my life that I was not faithful to God, but you know what? He was so faithful to me, crazy faithful to me. And so I reflect on what he's done. I reflect on his goodness, church. All the good things he's done in my life. Man, I reflect on his grace. You know how much grace God has given me? <laughs> Same in mind he's given to you. I reflect on his answered prayers. Have you ever actually taken an inventory on how many times God has answered your prayers? <laughs> I mean, I'm talking about even the, the easy ones, right? Like, God, I need you to take care of this. He does, right? And then the heavy, deep ones like, Lord, I need you to do a great moving in my life, in my family's life. I need, Lord, I need you to move in my marriage because things aren't good right now. And he does. You reflect on his answered prayers. Man, you reflect on how he has changed the lives. Check out verse eight one more time. It says, he has saved me from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. Church, you know what that means? It means he has delivered my soul from eternal death. He delivered me. You be still, you wait on God, and you reflect on what he's done. Not what he hasn't done yet, church. He's still on the job. He's still doing some things. Not what he hasn't done yet, you reflect on what he has done. Remember all those things that God's done. Think about that faithfulness. Man, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, remember he delivered you from hell. He took care of that for you. Understand, church, he's forgiven you. Understand that you are a new creation in Christ. The Bible said the old is gone and the new has come, right? You know what that should do for you? That should bring rest to your soul. That should bring rest to each and every one of our souls that he will not hold your sins against you. He's not gonna hold them against you any longer. That should calm you down. Reflect on who he is, church. Ha, he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. He is the lamb of God and he is also the lion of Judah, isn't he? And he soon is gonna be returning, church, is the conquering king of kings and lord of lords. He's coming back to claim what is his. And we serve a God that is so big. And for those of you who love him, church, and has been called according to his purpose, do you realize he's going to bring good into your life out of the mess that Satan tries to make it? He can bring about some good stuff for you. He's also, he's the one who declares, church, he says, I've got plans for you. Man, when someone on this earth, human being I'm talking about, man or woman, they come to me and say, man, I got plans for you. I'm usually like, Puh, what's that mean? What do, you, what do you want from me? But God says this, he says, I've got plans for you. And they're good plans, man. I'm talking about good and pleasing. I'm talking perfect plans for your life. He plans to prosper you, church. He plans to bless you. He doesn't want to harm you. But what he wants to do is give you hope in a future church. And when you meditate on him, when you meditate on his word, and in those moments when you're worrying about tomorrow, you start to realize this. You realize he's already in tomorrow. He's already in there doing his thing in tomorrow for me. 
He's already taken care of tomorrow. And because he was faithful yesterday to me, and he was, because he was faithful to me yesterday, you know, as I stand here today, he's going to be faithful again tomorrow. <laughs> and I believe that our spiritual enemy, church, I believe with all my heart, if our spiritual enemy cannot make us bad, you know what he'll do? He'll make you busy. He will make you busy so you can't focus on your heavenly father. Some of our souls today are way too busy. As I ask the praise team to come up here today, I want you to think about where you stand personally. Think about this. I want you to take just a few minutes today uh, right now, I'm talking about right now. I want you to take just a few minutes and I want you to reflect today, church. I want you to reflect on how faithful God has been to you. Man, I want you to reflect on God's goodness in your life. I want you to reflect on all those gifts that God has given you today. And you realize, church, that you serve a good, good father who loves to give good gifts to his children. So I seriously, I just want you to take a moment right now. I want you to just close your eyes. Separate yourself from everything else that's going on. Don't you be worrying about lunch right now. Lunch is coming. I want you to be thinking about what it is God has done for you. And here's what else I want you to think about. I want you to think about where you stand with him today. Some of you guys, man, he's delivered you from some horrible things in your life. Some addictions, some struggles, some really bad situations. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's a marriage that's in shambles. Maybe it's some kind of abuse that you suffered in your life. And God's delivered you. And I want you to literally just take a moment and be quiet and be still and think about what he's done for you. Maybe church, as you sit here, maybe it's this one minute for you. That it is this one minute that you heard something that clicked in your heart. You heard something today that reached clear deep down into your soul. And you realize, you know what? I'm thinking about it and I know that I'm not right. I know I'm not where I'm supposed to be Maybe you are way far off in left field. Maybe today you're that guy or that girl that's just sitting on the fence all the time. I'm going to be on the fence. I'll do my Sunday morning duty, but I'm going to live like the rest of the world the rest of the week. And God's telling you, no, that's not my plans for you. He's telling you today, and he wants you to know that Satan owns the fence. That you can't jump back and forth from weekend to weekday. And he's telling you that it's time for you to make it right with him. So this morning as you sit here, maybe you know I've got to get my life right. Tomorrow's not promised for anybody. And you're like, I, I got to get this right. Let today be the day, church, where you're saying, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to focus on you. I'm going to give you all of my stuff. And Lord, I need you to forgive me for who I was in my past. And Father, I want you to come into my heart today. And I want to be the man or I want to be the woman that you created me to be. And church, if that is you today, I want to encourage you, you come forward, please. Don't waste another day. God's got better plans for you than what you could ever imagine. And for the rest of you believers in Jesus Christ, those of you who sit here every Sunday, I want to ask you this, are you restless? Are you that restless soul 
that you can't focus on what it is that God has for you. You can't focus on his goodness. You can't focus on his faithfulness. Man, you can't even focus on the plans he has for you because the world is screaming in your ears and you're only focused on that. I want to encourage you. You take that time and you come back to where it is that God called you to. So how about it, church? I want you to stand together and sing. But man, I want you to focus on him today.